I'm going to ask Dave. Um, Dave Earl, the original title of Dave's talk has been changed. It's now the sad story of John Terry Guest. So please do join me in welcoming Dave. Thanks, Christine. It's a pleasure to be here. So this talk is going to take exactly 18 minutes. Um, <laughs> but I'm very happy to speak to anyone afterwards if you've got some further questions. So for those of you who aren't aware, these talks are being recorded. So if you're listening to this podcast, you can view the slides that go with this talk on my website at davegl.com. So this is John Carey Guest, known as Carey to his family. He was born in September 1952 in Melbourne through a routine and relatively uneventful labour. While still in hospital, his mother June observed he was feeding weakly and not too long after that, he was diagnosed with encephalitis, a swelling of the brain most likely caused by an infection. Carey was gravely, gravely ill. Five weeks later, Carey was finally released from hospital, having endured partial paralysis down his left side and pyloric stenosis, which is a stomach disorder, which causes forceful, continuous vomiting. After returning home, poor Carey subsequently caught the measles, then scarlet fever, and on top of that, was constantly bothered by bronchial infections, skin rashes, and perpetually troubled ears. By the time he was one, Carey seemed back on track, a charming, beautiful little toddler. Two years later, June and her husband Julius were again growing concerns. Carey still wasn't speaking, he was very excitable, and he showed little interest in his parents or other people. With apprehension, they presented Carey to a local paediatrician. Routine tests were administered, and unfortunately, the results were bleak. According to the doctor, Carey was grossly retarded and no treatment could help. In 1955, the term mentally retarded was loaded with a whole host of meanings it doesn't have today. For a start, it carried a tremendous stigma and was popularly thought to be the result of racial degeneration. Old wives' tales of something in the family were very commonplace in 1955. Secondly, a diagnosis of mental retardation, at least in the minds of medical professionals, would lead to only one outcome, lifelong incarceration in one of the government's large, run-down and overcrowded mental asylums. So I'm a historian of disability. What I do is I trace the ways in which we imagine and understand categories of difference. Now, these change over time, and I would argue that historical shifts in our conceptions of disabilities and people with disabilities tells us a lot about broader and very fundamental aspects of our society. So today, in the remaining 16 minutes, I'm going to look a little bit more closely at Carey's story and use it to unravel the state of play in the early 1950s, a time which, I'll argue, saw some very important shifts in not only our understanding of what was then called mental retardation, but broader understandings of citizenship, social value, and government services such as education. So Carey, in 1955, was diagnosed as being grossly retarded, with no hope of treatment and no prospects for the future. He was doomed to a life secreted away in a government asylum, biding his time until he succumbed to a frequently early death perhaps from pneumonia, typhoid, or tuberculosis. So perhaps unsurprisingly, June and Julius resisted that prognosis. Unsatisfied with the paediatrician's opinion, they sought help from an old family friend, a lady psychologist they had known for many years. Perhaps in an effort to be reassuring, she suggested that June keep a careful record of Carey's development so that a fairer assessment could be made, perhaps in a few months' time. That night, June pulled an exercise book out and began penning, in the third person, what she called a case diary for Carey. Over the following years, she meticulously charted her family's daily life, Carey's medical appointments and developments, and her strategies to solve Carey's problem. And when June died in the 1990s, the diary, along with ephemera primarily related to her musical career, made its way to the National Library, where until recently it sat unnoticed buried among many, many metres of documents relating to famous authors and politicians. So this diary gives us a remarkable insight into how June made sense of her son's differences. She begins with a discussion of her and her husband's family backgrounds. 
Julius came from a line of intellectuals, scholars, doctors and merchants, and June was a descendant of businessmen and professionals. Julius was a scientific research worker at Melbourne University, and June was a writer and musician, a celebrated pianist. Neither of their families, she wrote, had any background of abnormalities. But their good pedigree presented something of a problem, and the fact that June begins her case history with this hereditary background reminds us how much sway older ideas about degeneracy still held in the post-war period. So around the turn of the 20th century, Australians considered their new nation to be the great social laboratory of the world. We're at the forefront of new measures such as compulsory primary education and public baby clinics such as this one in Alexandria and school medical inspection schemes which observe children throughout their formative years. But as these more positive measures of improving our national type took hold, some scientists began proposing that, the same way that selective breeding had been shown to improve plants and animals, unselective breeding might possibly lead to some sort of degeneration. These kinds of ideas came to be known as the science of eugenics, and in Australia, as in many other countries, they became increasingly widespread throughout the 1920s and 1930s. Eugenicists grew particularly alarmed about people they called mentally deficient, who were said to breed more voraciously than most people and cause a disproportionate amount of vice and crime in the community. Studies emerged that claimed to show that 90% of crime was caused by mentally deficient people and that 90% of mental deficiency was caused by poor heredity. After the war, the idea of mental deficiency was modified and became relabeled as mental retardation and a range of studies disproved most links between heredity and deficiency. Yet the old stigma of something in the family lived on. As late as 1950, for example, newspapers such as the Sydney Morning Herald continued to nonchalantly report that compulsory sterilisation in the United States was stopping people from passing on their defects to future generations. So for someone like June, a mentally retarded son simply didn't make sense. Retardation was something that happened to others, to people of degenerate backgrounds and questionable moral qualities. Throughout the diary, June recalls her family's good stock and also notes that her husband, now a scientist, didn't talk until he was almost four. But she also notes, particularly as Kara grew larger, an impending sense of ostracism from her peers. Now that he's older, she wrote, friends and strangers feel an impulsion to stare, offer advice, or inquire what is wrong. This sideways comment played heavily upon June's mind. And Kerry continued to grow. And as he got larger, June found his behaviour, at least on some days, increasingly disturbing. He had an irresistible urge to climb, she wrote. She found difficulty in stopping him from unrolling the toilet roll, and he got enormous satisfaction from closing doors. But on other days, apart from his noticeable lack of language, Kerry seemed like an ordinary little three-year-old. So throughout the whole period, the threat of institutionalisation loomed like a dark shadow over June and Kerry's life. Back in 1955, there were few special schools or opportunity classes to help backwards or mentally retarded children. Indeed, it was common wisdom amongst educators that the presence of disruptive elements in classrooms would do little more than hold the other children back. When June enrolled Carey at the local kindergarten in early 1956, his problem behaviour soon brought him to the attention of teachers. So kindergartens became popular in the 1920s, often targeted at working class families. Kindergartens were introduced with the hope of instilling young children with values of cleanliness and civic mindedness at an early age. One of the suite of positive eugenic reforms propagated in the early years of the 20th century. But by the post-war period, like schools themselves, kindergarten attendance had taken on new social meanings. It was a rite of passage not only for the children, but also for the mothers and the families of those attending, for suburban housewives like June. Schools and kindergartens had become part of the lifeblood of local communities, and the opportunity to reach out from the home and into broader social networks of like-minded women. The informal support structures of communities of housewives sustained many a woman through dreary days of domestic drudgery and endless rounds of washing. And Carey too enjoyed kindergarten, wearing a radiant smile whenever he attended. Fortunately, this happiness was short-lived because in April 1956, 
the children at the kindergarten were routinely examined by a doctor from the health department. Although Carey was found to be in perfect physical health, the doctor was concerned that the child's excitability and so-called retarded speech was beginning to disturb the other children. Further, Carey had developed a habit of rushing around and pushing the equipment. After many deliberations, the kindergarten teachers decided that Carey should cease attending. His best place was at home, away from stimuli, and prevented from possibly harming the other children in the centre in one fell swoop. They also excised his mother from the social network of support which existed amongst the kindergarten mothers. She lost not only respite from Carey, but participation in the wider social community. Off the record, the health department doctor suggested that June seriously consider what he called a residential placement. So by residential placement, the doctor meant only one thing, institutionalisation in Kew Cottages, a large residential hospital for so-called idiots, widely known to Melbournians and universally regarded as atrocious. So the Kew Idiot Asylum, as it was originally known, was opened in 1887 on the banks of the Yarra River in Kew and downhill from the much more impressive Lunatic Asylum, which had opened in 1871. Whereas the Lunatic Asylum was believed to hold a curative function, established to help therapeutically heal lunatics and restore them to society, the Idiot Asylum was formed along much more cynical lines. Doctors believed there was no cure for mental deficiency and the Kew Cottages, as they became known, were set up to house inmates for the remainder of their lives. No one ever left Kew Cottages. So populations in Australian mental institutions exploded during the first half of the 20th century, reaching a peak in the years immediately following the Second World War. But funding for them never caught up. In the late 1940s, a series of public scandals revealed the atrocious conditions in the hospital wards. Hospitals in New South Wales were described as something from the Dark Ages. In Perth, Parkside Mental Hospital was found to be overcrowded by 200%. Buildings were shambolic and waters were accused of viciously beating patients. But of all the hospitals in Australia, Kew Cottages were thought to be the worst and conditions were brought sharply to public attention in 1953, just a few months after Carey's birth. That April, the Melbourne Herald reported the story of Michael, a six-year-old boy whose story was uncannily similar to Carey's. Michael was so-called mentally retarded and as a result had been excluded from the public school system. He spent his days at home where his mother struggled to cope with his problematic behaviour. Doctors had similarly recommended that Michael be given a placement at Kew, but his mother, having visited the hospital, had vowed she would never admit him. Instead, they managed Michael's behaviour by tethering him to a stake in the backyard. A public outcry ensued when Michael's story was made public by the prominent Melbourne columnist, Ed Tipping. Over the following weeks, members of the public gave over 40,000 pounds to a relief fund the Herald set up to buy clothing and other essentials for the inmates of Kew Cottages. The state government matched the figure, promising to undertake much needed maintenance on the asylum's dishevelled buildings. Everyone in Melbourne knew what was happening in Kew, but still little changed. When Ed Tipping visited again 18 months later in October 1954, he found red tape had stifled many improvements. The residents still got about barefoot in burlap overalls. While some of the wards had gay new curtains, other residents were still herded together in asphalt pens, left back to back in beds wedged together with unlauded grey rags for blankets. And for Ed Tipping, the journalist, this was particularly disturbing because, unknown to the public at the time, his own son Peter was also mentally retarded and just a few years later was reluctantly placed in queue. So early historical studies have suggested that some parents at least were happy to abandon their children to institutions, that they would follow the doctor's advice, place them away and forget them, forget your child, try for another right away, pretend they never existed. But my own research has suggested a more complex landscape. Ed Tipping, Michael's mother and father, and June and Julia's guest were just few of thousands of parents across Australia who refused, at least initially, to give up on their mentally retarded children. Indeed, June's diary reveals continued attempts to cure or alleviate Carey's condition. First, June tried Horlicks, which was spruced in the popular press as having impressive remedial effects. A bit later, 
she administered glutamic acid, which was frequently touted as being able to cure backwardness and was available for import at great expense from America. Finally, on the advice of her psychologist friends, she tried chlorpromazine, a recently developed antipsychotic, coupled with a mild amphetamine. In September 1956, Carey turned four, and his parents watched intently as he played with a train set he had received as a gift, though all he could say about it, according to June, was ain, ain, ain. He's still a puzzle, June wrote later that night, a mixture of intelligence and backwardness. Julius, on the other hand, was more sceptical, observing that Carey's speech had shown no real improvement since she was assessed a year previously, and, at home with no support, no prospect of school or kindergarten for Carey, and isolated from social communities, June became increasingly strained. By November that year, June felt that Carey was becoming increasingly difficult in the family life. And a few weeks later, she wrote in the diary that the situation in the family continues to worsen. The mother is beginning to realise that if Carey remains, remains, the group must rapidly disintegrate. And not long after that, Julius put his foot down. So this part of the diary is particularly poignant because if you look just on the left side from you, um, you can make up some teardrops um, towards the left and towards the centre. June wrote, the father, who is less emotionally involved than the mother, is determined that the institution is the only solution for the child to save the family from being wrecked. And she continues, the mother had a long discussion with the clinic doctor, who most strongly advised the same idea as the father. The best thing would be for Carrie to be placed in a suitable boarding place as soon as possible. And so the wheels were set in motion. Within a month, four-year-old Carrie had been admitted to Kew Cottages, certified as insane by the family GP and a colleague. The day that June deposited Carrie at Kew to take up residence one of the older, unrenovated cottages, along with 600 other child inmates, she was advised by the house nurse to leave Carrie be, to let him settle in with his new family and his own kind. So June signed off with the diary with a sense of completion. Here ends this phase of the story, she wrote. And I could stop there, but if you give me 30 more seconds, um, because there's a much bigger epilogue to this story, <coughs> one that forms the bulk of my research, and you're welcome to read about further on my website and also my publications. In fact, June visited Carrie very frequently at Hugh Cottages, and later in that year, she came across other parents, many of them with children in a similar situation. And she called a public meeting, and together they formed the Kew Cottages Parents Association, over the decades, the parents raised funds for the upgrade of wards, for televisions, and for new clothes to replace the burlap coveralls that had previously adorned the inmates. And at around the same time, parents around Australia in Brisbane, Sydney, Perth, and a host of smaller towns began to gather, communicating through flyers, meeting in public. They soon amassed a core of several thousand activist parents. And together, these parents not only began improving conditions at places such as Kew, but they began opening their own special schools and day centres. Carey did spend the rest of his life at Kew Cottages. Here he is with his sister at age 15, dressed at least in a suit provided by the Parents Association. But had he only been born 10 years later, though, he would never have entered Kew Cottages. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. That's